Hi, I'm Jeff Hajek, the owner and founder of Election. This video is part of my lean training system. It was originally released as a DVD a long time ago, but times have changed and the look of some of these LTS videos is now a bit dated. The content is still spot on though. So rather than just discontinue the line, I am posting the majority of each of the 36 videos here with the remainder available at Velaction Videos. That's our video service where you can download a wealth of supporting content and watch subscriber only videos. I recommend subscribing and hitting the notification button if you want to make sure you don't miss any new content. I would also really appreciate if you would hit the like button if this video is helpful and you want to see more content similar to it. The like button helps us get found on YouTube, but it also lets us figure out where you want us to put our future effort. Now enjoy the free version of this video. Welcome to Velaction Continuous Improvement's presentation on how to use metrics to manage your operation. My name is Jeff Hajek, and I am the owner and founder of Velaction. I am also the author of the book, What Do You Mean I Gotta Be Lean? Let's take a moment now to talk about what you should take away from this presentation. First of all, we want you to learn the benefits that using metrics can bring to your management style. We also want you to learn how to determine which metrics to use. And of course, a metric would not be effective unless it had a goal associated with it. We'll talk about how to go about gathering the information you need to get the most out of your metrics. And finally, we'll talk about how to use metrics to make improvements in your operation. Let's start off by defining what a metric actually is. In a nutshell, it is a standard measurement that you use to gauge performance and that performance can be either of a process or of an organization. Imagine trying to drive your car without the gauges on your dashboard. You could probably do it, but it would be a challenge. And there's also a good chance that you'd run into problems. For example, without a speedometer, you'd be likely to get speeding tickets. What the gauges let you do is recognize abnormal conditions and make adjustments when things aren't going as planned. Now in your business, your metrics will probably be logged over time, but they serve the same purpose. They let you know how you're doing. Metrics have to be more than just a number, though. They have to be associated with an expectation. Think back to the dashboard on your car. Seeing 3000 on an RPM gauge doesn't mean anything unless you have an expectation of where it should be. If you're cruising down the highway, it might be your optimum range. But if you're sitting at a stoplight, it could indicate a problem. The same principles apply when you're using metrics to manage an operation. For example, productivity of 7.1 units per labor hour might be good if you'd been averaging 6, and it might be poor if you'd been averaging 10. You have to know where it should be. Now in most cases, this expectation is a little bit higher than your current performance. Typically, companies are always striving to get better. And this chart shows that. The A indicates actual performance, and the T indicates your target performance. The target will likely be a little higher than your actual. But from your current state, there's three potential future states. In the first state, your actual performance starts to slip. And this is what we commonly call a problem. Having good metrics in place lets you identify this situation early so you can immediately make an effective countermeasure. Nipping problems in the bud often dramatically reduces their cost. In the second state, your actual performance is static, but the target rises. This is normally done to capitalize on some sort of opportunity. For example, the sales team may have been doing some data mining and realized that the customers that receive their products the fastest tended to order more. That would indicate that a faster delivery time would lead to higher sales. Discoveries such as these often drive more aggressive targets. The third future state is the status quo. Now that doesn't mean that your actual and your target are the same. It just means that both are moving along as expected. But even in the status quo, you can't get complacent, and that's because the competition isn't. There's a good chance their performance is actually increasing. And in today's cutthroat business environment, that's the same as your performance dropping. 
But regardless of which of these future states you're facing, there really is only one reason to actually use a metric. And that is to highlight specific improvement opportunities. It's easy to know that you have to get better. It's much harder to know specifically where you need to improve. I'd like you to keep a few things in mind as we continue talking about metrics. The first is that to make an improvement on a process, you have to deeply understand it. And that leads into the second point here. Metrics drive a high level of process scrutiny. When you see something changing in a metric, it's hard not to dive in and look why it's happening. And you may notice that the common link in these first two insights is that they both consume resources. Investigations take time. If you put a metric in place, make sure that it actually measures a true need. Insignificant metrics dilute the value of measuring your operation. Getting the most out of your metrics requires understanding that not all metrics are created equal. Most people think of metrics as measuring the output of a process. Those are known as results metrics, but there's also something called a process metric. Now if you think of how a result actually comes to pass, there's normally many steps in a process to get to that result. So if results metrics measure at the end of a process, it's obvious that process metrics measure somewhere earlier. Process metrics focus on the activities that lead to the results. A good measurement plan will include both process and results metrics. Let's take a look at how they compare. The biggest difference between the two is that process metrics measure how we are doing right now. Results metrics look at how we did in the past. And this difference in the timing plays a big role in how we use the metrics. Process metrics are great for taking immediate action. Results metrics are more focused on reflection. And that reflection is very useful when you're developing strategy. But it's not as helpful when you're trying to find the root causes of a problem. To get those, you need to have a better understanding of the process that's causing your issue. One thing that is probably clear to you is that process metrics are much more useful at the front line. Frontline leaders and their teams tend to be very focused on production. They want to make sure they get their work done for the day. Process metrics help them do that. And one of the big reasons it's so helpful for them is that process metrics operate on a very short cycle. In some cases, they can provide near real-time information. That fast pace of information is very useful when doing the plan, do, check, act cycle of problem solving. Let's take a look at how process metrics and results metrics work in real life. There are two common measurements that people use to evaluate their fitness. The first is that they might measure their weight. And the second is that they count calories. Now as popular as measuring weight is, the problem is that it's hard to act upon that information. Doctors like it because it helps evaluate future risk. But for the typical person trying to lose weight, Looking at a scale tells you how you did. It doesn't tell you right now that you're doing something right or wrong. Counting calories, on the other hand, lets you take immediate action. Imagine that it is the middle of the day and you realize you've had too many calories. There is still time to adjust. You could have a light dinner or eliminate an evening snack and get back on track. So in this situation, what it really comes down to is the results metric tells you whether your plan was effective. The process metric tells you whether you're sticking to your plan. I hope you're getting something valuable out of this video. If you want to get more out of this program, we recommend watching it on Velaction videos. You'll be able to watch the entire video, mostly ad-free, and view subscriber-only programs. You'll also have access to a load of continuous improvement downloads. So let's talk about some actual metrics you might see in your workplace. A common results metric is a customer satisfaction score. Now that score comes from a variety of activities that a frontline team performs. Answering the phone is one of those activities. The average time it takes to answer that phone might be something that matters to the customer. Eventually that will impact the customer satisfaction score. But if the employees had to wait until the end of the month to see their customer satisfaction scores, 
there's a good chance that changes in their hold time would have gone unnoticed. Similarly, these other results metrics each have process metrics that are associated with it. Again, each of these process metrics are things that you can make immediate adjustments to. So if you see something changing, you can take action. The results metrics, while they show how effective the organization is, again, they come after the fact and they're not closely tied to an activity. It can be a challenge to figure out what to do to fix things. So how should you go about setting up a new metric? Well, the first place to start is by looking at the voice of the customer. It is critical to understand what your customers want you to deliver if you're going to try to measure your organization. And the second thing you have to know is your strategy. Any metrics you have in place need to align with the overall goals of the organization. The third step is to take a close look at your daily management. You'll want to identify the core business activities you need to improve on, and you'll also have the opportunity to add metrics based on the improvement opportunities you identify. One of the benefits of daily management is that it highlights problems as soon as they occur. Problems that occur frequently and are disruptive to flow provide good ideas for metrics. Once you've identified the things you want to measure, you have to set targets. These goals can either be thresholds to keep performance from dropping, or they can be set to spur improvement. With the goals in place, it's time to define the process metrics that will lead you to achieving those goals. This will include defining the units as well as setting the targets for your process metrics. You'll also need a data collection plan. This should be very specific. It needs to include instructions on how to collect the data, who collects it, and what tools or measuring instruments they need to use. It also should clearly indicate where the data is stored and when it should be posted. Once data is collected, it needs to be compiled. Process metrics need to be compiled very quickly, in some cases even real time. Results metrics do not tend to be as time sensitive. Once metrics are updated, you need to look at them. You need to evaluate what they mean. And you need to turn that meaning into action. Metrics are worthless if they're not acted upon. I mentioned VOC a few times already. Now I'm going to take a second and talk about what it is. In a nutshell, it's a combination of all the different ways that a customer communicates what it wants and what it needs to your company. Some of this information is actively gathered and some of it is passive. The customer simply puts it out there and you receive it. Likewise, some of this information is quantitative. It's actually numerically based and some of it is qualitative. This second category is more focused on opinion. When you combine these two factors, you get four basic categories of voice of the customer. Fact collecting is when you go out and seek numerical data. Data mining is when you go through things like sales records and look for fact-based information. Opinion gathering includes things like customer surveys and focus groups. The key here is that you're looking for basic ideas, not necessarily hard facts and data. And the final quadrant includes the air to the ground. Essentially, this is watching blogs, listening for news reports, and just trying to gather up any information that's out there about your company. So why is this important? Well, essentially, the way your customers grade you should provide you with valuable insight about which results metrics would be important. A well-done strategy looks a lot like an onion. The outside layer is the corporate vision. This is the big picture view of where the company wants to go. Turning that into something actionable, though, requires a top-level strategy. And that top-level strategy should cascade down to the organizations within the company. And that lower-level strategy should turn into improvement priorities. Now, some of you may recognize this as policy deployment. And those of you who do will know that the improvement priorities are focused on processes. 
That means they provide a great source of process metrics. Now, daily management is primarily about monitoring production and keeping production on track. Now, this close scrutiny obviously requires some metrics, but it also helps you uncover other metrics, other opportunities of things to measure and help the company get better. But again, as I mentioned earlier, the real benefit of daily management is that it allows you to take immediate action. When one of your gauges gets out of whack, you should have a switch that you can flip and get things back on track. Those switches come in the form of things like a flexible workforce, playbooks, and other things of that nature. Let's talk now about a few things to keep in mind when setting goals. The first is that there is a difference between targets and target conditions. The target condition is more of a visualization of what the process will look like when it's meeting all of your targets. Essentially, the target condition puts your targets into context. It's a subtle distinction and one that can be very difficult to grasp. Visualizing this future state, this target condition of an operation, can sometimes help you understand its shortcomings better than simply looking at a list of numbers. Of all the things I coach people on, this next point tends to be one of the most surprising to them. People are often stunned when I tell them they should be hitting about a 70% success rate. The reason I choose this number is that if you set it much lower, people get frustrated. They want to achieve success. They want a feeling of accomplishment. But the problem is, if the number creeps much higher than 70, the goals tend to be fairly weak. If people feel that falling short of a 100% success rate will lead to consequences, they'll make sure their goals are easy to hit 100% of the time. And goals that are easy to hit don't tend to drive very big improvements. The next recommendation for setting goals is to avoid sweeping or arbitrary goals. And what I mean by this is to not have a standing 10% annual improvement objective. Improvement objectives should come as a result of the catch ball process. This is simply a back and forth exchange in which managers and their reports come up with a basic action plan and figure out how far they can take their improvement efforts. Two basic things should drive your improvement objectives. Opportunity or need. Standard goals are a shortcut and are often ineffective. The final point here is to make sure that your metrics, your targets, actually match your action plan. Obviously, this won't happen on the first pass. That means metrics and action plans are developed together. But in the end, they should both be synced up. What this means is that if you have a Kaizen activity planned in June, you should see a corresponding change in your July target. Earlier, I talked about process metrics versus results metrics, but there are a few different ways that metrics can be broken down. One way is by their duration. When a metric is related to an opportunity or a problem, it may be temporary. Once you've achieved the results you want, there's no longer a purpose to keep tracking that metric. Some things, though, should be measured forever. Things that are critical to quality fall into this category, as do things that relate to your core business. The other breakdown is by whether the metric is being evaluated against a constant target or whether there is improvement built into the goals. The latter is far more common than the first one. Other than safety, you are very unlikely to see many flat target lines. And to be clear, the safety line is set at a very, very aggressive threshold. As part of the lean training system this video comes from, we offer a variety of lean LEGO training packages. These include our lean LEGO flow simulation, mistake proofing or pokey oak lean LEGO exercise, and our visual controls and 5S lean LEGO exercise. We've also got an office flow simulation for those not implementing continuous improvement on the shop floor. Click the links in the description below or click on cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Speaking of safety, it is one of the primary groups of metrics. You will often see metrics organized by QDC or QDCSM. But not all of these metrics should be handled the same way. 
Apart from safety, quality is generally considered the most important of these groups. Because of that, the long-term goal should be to maximize it. Over time, you should be getting closer and closer to zero defects. In the short term, though, quality metrics should be linked to customer needs, to specific customer needs, and set as a threshold. What that means is that once you've hit your quality targets, it's okay to spend your resources on improving your other metrics. Delivery metrics are also very important because they are customer facing. But generally speaking, there is some limit where improving your delivery time will not do much for sales. What that means is that at some point, the incremental value to a customer for a faster delivery becomes close to zero. For example, Let's say a coffee shop can get a cup of coffee in a customer's hand within 40 seconds of an order being placed. Would getting that number down to 35 seconds do much for sales? It is unlikely those five extra seconds will make a big difference in a customer's purchasing decision. Once quality and delivery are taken care of, it's okay to go after cost. You should make every effort to maximize your cost savings. But even though cost is third on the list, in truth, the majority of quality and delivery improvements also impact it. The main point is not to focus on cost reduction until you've taken care of your quality and delivery. Safety is listed here not because of importance, but because of convention. Most people list these metrics as QDCSM. Just keep in mind that even though safety is toward the end, it's the most important metric you have. In many ways, morale is the forgotten metric group. There's a good chance you do have some morale metrics in your HR group. They probably have a way of looking to make sure their benefits are competitive and that turnover is low. But it's something of a shame if more organizations throughout the company do not look at it also. The fact is, good morale helps all of your other metrics. QDCNS all improve with engaged, satisfied employees. At this point, I'd like to talk about process metrics in a little bit more detail. If you recall, earlier I talked about results metrics. They're measured at the very end of a process. The problem with that, though, is that there can be a very long delay between a time that something happens and when the result is felt. That's not to say, though, that results metrics are not valuable. They provide a good indication about whether the process is delivering upon customer expectations. But again, if you're a frontline employee or a frontline supervisor, you are probably more interested in how you are doing right now. And that's where process metrics come in. The first step to getting a good process metric is to really deeply understand the process. A detailed flowchart is a good way to do this. Don't just take an existing flowchart, though, and don't do one by memory. I recommend you go out and observe the process and make a fresh flowchart. Few things give a better understanding of a process than going to Gemba and seeing it firsthand. Once you have that very strong understanding of what's going on within the operation, it's a relatively simple task to figure out what to measure. Decision points are obvious sources of metrics. Your problem log also highlights good opportunities for measurement. Once you've picked all that low-hanging fruit, go through your process flowchart with a fine-tooth comb and look for other measurement opportunities. At this point, you might have a rather lengthy list of metrics. You'll want to wean it down to just a handful of metrics. Three to five is a good rule of thumb, but in organizations with higher needs, you might have as many as seven. Just be careful not to get too many or you'll get overwhelmed. Now one final point before we move on. I recommend doing this analysis with a future state process map. Remember the discussion about target conditions? If you're looking at the future state, your metrics will be more closely aligned with where you want to be than where you are. I want to stress this one final point about process metrics. The reason I'm such a big fan of them is they help speed up the pace of your improvement. And there's really two reasons for this. The first is the obvious one. The sooner you identify an error, the easier it is to go back and investigate it. You're more likely to catch things in the act. 
if you're looking at a results metric and you go back three or four days after the fact, the conditions are probably significantly different. It makes it much harder to identify the root cause of the problem. The other big reason is one of urgency. When you're looking at a results metric at the end of the month, there's not a feeling that you have to go take care of it right now. After all, the problem happened maybe two or three weeks ago. But with a process metric, you often see the problem as it's happening. Because there is actually an opportunity to go and take care of the problem while it is occurring, people are more inclined to take action. When creating a metric, it is very important to be clear about the units you're using. I'd like to illustrate this with the example on the screen. This organization likes to keep the number of late orders under 15. The chart shows their progress over a 10 day period. But reporting these numbers is not that simple. You can tally them up in a lot of different ways. The takeaway is to be very clear in the units that you are using. In some cases, it might just be a matter of convention so people know what they're looking at. In other cases, though, the way you tally your numbers can change the meaning. The tool on your screen is a KPI Bowler. KPI stands for Key Performance Indicator, and that's just a fancy way of saying important metrics. As far as the term bowler, it gets its name because of its similarity to a bowling scorecard. This tool allows you to see, at a glance, how your organization is doing. You'll notice that along the left-hand side, the categories that we talked about earlier are listed. Quality, delivery, cost, safety, and morale. This bowler shows an annual plan in it. And remember, as we talked about earlier, you're not going to make even progress throughout the year to get from your starting point to where you want to be in December. Make sure that the bowler reflects your action plan. And a final point I want to make about this KPI bowler is that it should have an owner. There should be a single individual responsible for each bowler you have. In most cases, that person will be the manager of the area. On a side note, if you would like to use this KPI bowler in your organization, feel free to download it from www.valaction.com. You'll also find some more detailed instructions on how to use it. One of the things that many people have to adjust to in a lean organization is the fact that metrics are posted very conspicuously. One of the most common methods of posting is the KPI board. The board itself can be anything from an easel to a taped off section of wall on up to a felt covered bulletin board. The important thing though is not what the board is made of, but what is put on it. KPI boards commonly have sections for each of the major categories. Due to space constraints though, you may see safety and morale put together. While this might seem to be minimizing its importance, the reality is when you have a serious safety problem or morale problem, you address it right away. Because of that bias for immediate action, there's less need for real estate on the board. The operation of the board is actually rather simple. Each of the categories is labeled, and below it a chart showing its progress is posted. If everything is on track, you would see a board that looks similar to this. But if you had a sharp eye, you would have noticed that everything is not on track. Our delivery metric is falling short and has been for several months. In this situation, if you're falling short on your metric, you should definitely see a countermeasure to go along with it, and that would be posted right below the chart. This KPI board also has a neat little feature. The headers are reversible. One side is green and the other side is red. Obviously, if you fall behind, you flip it around to the red side. A metric without accuracy is worthless. It will drive you down the wrong path and have you making poor decisions. For that reason, you'll want to make sure you have a good data collection plan. Obviously, the plan should say who does the data collection. But it's also a good idea to make sure there's a backup plan. Otherwise, you'll end up with a lot of gaps in your data if the original person is absent. Also be clear about what data should be collected. In some cases, supporting data will be collected in addition to the primary data. 
When you're collecting every single piece of data, the when is not as important. But sometimes the data is a snapshot. Perhaps you're checking the temperature of an oven every hour. Be clear about when the data is collected or you'll introduce bias into your system. Make sure the data collection plan indicates not only where the measurement should be taken, but also where it should be recorded. Finally, document how the data should be collected. This is especially important if measurement tools are being used. Get more out of our Lean Training System videos with our Continuous Improvement Companion. It's closing in on a thousand pages of great content. It is currently available as a download with a subscription to Vlaction Videos and as a license through our store. You can also get a free version of it by signing up for our newsletter. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. As you start collecting data, you'll get much better at it. You'll find a variety of shortcuts and tricks that will make things easier and more efficient. Rather than climb that learning curve on your own though, here are a few tips to speed things along. The first tip is to make a conscious decision ahead of time whether you want to collect data for every item in question or if you would be better served to use a sampling plan. Obviously, sampling reduces the effort to collect data. Sampling plans are best when there is not much variation in a process. If you have a lot of fluctuation, you've got a good chance of seeing some wild swings to your data. A 100% data collection is also a good choice when you have low quantities of items that you are reviewing. If your total population is too low, you won't be able to get a representative sample. This tip is rather obvious when you see it here, but it is overlooked more often than you might think. Make a point of looking for ways to automate your data collection process. You'll be well served by working with your IT department here. They will likely have some good ideas that can save you some significant time. Keep in mind the automation doesn't just have to be the measuring step. You also need to record and compile and report the data. IT can save you a lot of time. The series of exclamation marks in this tip should be an indicator of its importance. Many companies have data that is easily accessible. If that data contains the information you need, you're in great shape. Often though it is close, but isn't an exact match. Resist the urge to alter your metric and the data collection plan to make use of the available data. There is an old joke about a person looking for keys under a street light. A friend walks up and offers to help search. The friend asks where the searcher lost the keys, and the response is, over there by the side of the house. The friend exclaims, why on earth are you looking for them here? Well, because it's brighter over here. Don't be the person searching under the street light. Get the right data, not the convenient data. The more data you have to make a decision, the better it will be. You leave less to chance when you have more information to work from. The problem, though, is that data collection has a cost. It is not free. You have to spend productive resources gathering up all that information. The impact of this trade-off is not typically on the metric itself, though. You'll have a fairly good idea of the data you need to track your KPIs. The uncertainty of the obstacles you might face drives this dilemma. When you collect a data point, you might need three bits of information to complete your metric. But there might be more bits of useful data available that can help if you need to do a countermeasure down the road. That's where the challenge lies. You are, in effect, buying an informational insurance policy. The best recommendation I can give is to collect more data when the process is unreliable and taper it back as you start eliminating more problems. A stable process probably needs very little extra data collection. Another thing to consider is that data can always be combined if it is too granular. It doesn't work in reverse though. You can take raw data on the size of a component and turn it into a pass-fail metric. You can't, though, tell from a data point of fail whether an item missed the spec by a little or by a mile. 
The prioritization of your work often requires knowing the magnitude of a problem. Once you have all your data collected, you'll need to compile it. Raw data is seldom useful as collected. It needs to be put in a format where it can be assessed. For example, in this image, you might have to put the data on production in with the data on labor hours to get a productivity metric. The ratio is much more meaningful than the individual pieces of data. One of the benefits of living in a computerized world, though, is that many processes can be automated. If at all possible, combine your data collection and compilation steps. This does two things. The first is that it reduces the time it takes to work on the data. The second, and perhaps more important part, is that it will reduce batching. A sophisticated lean leader will rely on data for decision making, so it tends to stay up to date. Those that are not as advanced on their lean journey, though, might not have data so tightly integrated into their management style. They tend to get sidetracked and let the data compilation fall behind. Metrics that are tracked continuously drive more action than those that are reviewed once a month, or even less frequently. The easier the data processing step is, the easier it is to make data become part of a leader's personal standard work. Once you have the data for a metric laid out in front of you, you need to evaluate it. Does the metric give you enough insight to act on a problem? Now that you have something tangible to look at, is it giving you all the information you thought it would? Do you need to adjust the information you are looking at? Metrics can take a bit of dialing in to get just right. A very important part of using metrics is to be able to find the root cause of a problem from them. If your metric takes you into a blind alley and you can't figure out the cause of a problem from it, there's not much value there. This video comes from Velaction's Lean Training System, which takes a module-based approach to learning about continuous improvement. Modules include a PowerPoint presentation and student guides for every video, plus there are many exercises and quizzes as well. There's also a whole host of supporting content in the form of terms in our Continuous Improvement Companion and downloadable articles. Our modules are currently available in our store and as downloads at Velaction Videos. Click the links in the description below or click on the cards that pop up on this video to learn more. We'll also add links at the end. Fortunately, if you've gone through the steps to systematically develop your metric, there is probably tremendous value in it. And that value comes because you will be able to act on the information you are tracking. It can be demoralizing to a team to spend a lot of time gathering data and never see anything tangible come of it. But if the information they collect spurs some efforts to improve, they will be more likely to support the data collection effort in the future. That action comes in many different flavors. In nearly all cases, though, measurement leads teams to unearth problems, deal with the issue, confirm that the solution works, and then standardize a new process. The new process is then measured, which perpetuates the cycle. Now this series of steps may have a ring of familiarity to it. It should. The steps of using metrics roughly corresponds to the plan, do, check, act cycle. And that cycle works best when it becomes ingrained in an organization. When it becomes ritualized, it is that automatic, every time, no excuses approach to managing with metrics that supercharges a continuous improvement effort. It is easy to skip a task that is not planned for and that is not built into the way of doing business. Think of brushing your teeth. You are probably very unlikely to come to work without breaking out the toothbrush. That is because you likely have made it part of your morning ritual. Improvement effort, specifically the way you use metrics to manage an operation, should have the same level of ritualization. I constantly point this last item out, and it seems like it routinely falls on deaf ears. If you want your organization to do continuous improvement activities as part of their jobs, you have to give them the time to do it. If data collection and managing metrics and resolving problems takes 20 hours a week, that is the equivalent of needing an extra half person on your staff. 
The time spent doing continuous improvement activities tends to pay off in the future, but there is a cost to it. If you make people force improvement into a tight schedule that is already full, you are sending a clear message about priorities. One of the really great things about using metrics as part of your ongoing management is that it acts to speed up the PDCA cycle. When people are first introduced to PDCA, they think of it as a tool for problem-solving projects. They seldom realize it doesn't have to be done only for big, resource-intensive events. In fact, there is a case to be made that big projects are great for complicated problems and for creating learning opportunities, but the true driver of improvement in a company comes from the small, fast, repeated, unrelenting, continuous application of PDCA whenever an abnormal condition presents itself. This short cycle approach obviously won't provide the same impact on a project to project basis as a week long Kaizen event would. But it makes up for that in volume. You can do a tremendous number of quick cycles, especially when you have ongoing metrics to give you feedback on whether the improvements are working. So, you can do a root cause analysis, make a change on a targeted part of the process, and then watch for the results of the change. You can change the same thing several more times over a short duration to dial it in. In addition to the impact from the actual change, you also build an improvement rhythm. When a problem is identified from monitoring a metric and you habitually make improvements right away, that speeds up the pace of improvement, frees up more time, and builds even more momentum. This rapid pace demands an all-hands-on-deck approach. It can't be just a few people working on keeping the group on track. The workload must be spread around. As a result, it gives people more opportunities to make meaningful changes than they are likely used to doing. That leads to stronger engagement and all the associated benefits of having a team that is vested in their jobs. Many of the improvements I've been talking about are just do it type of projects. Others, though, will take a bit more effort. When you have a miss on a monthly metric, it is important to have some systematic way of dealing with it. Not only does this approach help with solving problems, but it also acts as a communication tool. This countermeasure sheet is a valuable tool for getting metrics back on track and it should be required for any metric that falls more than 5% off the pace of improvement. Because the countermeasure sheet is used primarily for getting back on track with metrics, there is a section on gap analysis. This simply clarifies what the target is, where you are, and what the delta is. Keep in mind that a metric with an annual improvement target should already have an improvement plan to go with it. The countermeasure is an addendum to that plan. It is a way to take special action to get the plan back on track. A big part of this gap analysis is to figure out the root causes of the problems that are keeping the plan off track. But understanding these underlying reasons is only the first step. You also have to understand how big of an impact the particular issue is having on the plan. Obviously, if the gap is 10, and the root causes you are going to work on fixing only add up to 7, you won't close the gap. You'll need to find some more root causes. Identifying the sources of problems doesn't actually get you closer to being on track with your metric, though. You still have to take action. And to know whether the actions will be enough, you have to create a list of countermeasure tasks. As you do, you also have to estimate how big of an impact each will have on the root causes you identified. Not every root cause will be completely resolved with a single task. In addition to making sure the plan is sufficient, this analysis also makes sure you don't overestimate the impact of your countermeasures. The benefit of a solution cannot exceed the gap caused by the problem or problems it is addressing. So the purpose here is to make sure you are planning the right amount of activity to completely close the gap between where you are on your metric and where you want to be. When you add up the impact of all your countermeasures, 
you should be back on track. If not, you've got more planning to do. Metrics present an interesting challenge. They are your guides, so they should not be changed at the drop of a hat. But they also should not be set in stone. When reviewing your progress, make sure you are looking not just at how you are doing at hitting your targets, but also about whether the targets and metrics were established properly. Sometimes, as you start on your action plan, you will realize that you grossly underestimated the challenge you face. To be honest, that incorrect assessment is a problem that should be looked at, but it is not one that should continue to haunt you throughout the year. If a metric proves to be too challenging, you have two basic options. If the metric is one of your priorities, or is linked to a critical part of the overall business strategy, you'll have to reallocate resources. If the target is lower on the pecking order, and there are no more unallocated resources to throw at it, you'll have to adjust the target. Be careful not to confuse failing to act on a plan with a metric being too hard. Of course, if you skip the tasks on your plan for three or four months, it will seem too hard at the end of the year. But I urge you not to take the action of changing a metric lightly. It should be discussed with your leaders and they should be on board with any change. The flip side of that issue with metrics is that some are set way too cushy. On occasion, you'll think a problem is monumental, and after an early Kaizen event, you've reached the December target in March. You have two choices here. The first is to pull the resources you reserved for this metric and add them to another area that may be having more problems or you can stretch the goal and make it more challenging. The latter option should be rewarded. Leaders have a tendency to dismiss accomplishments that seem easy. Resist the urge. Thanks for watching this extended free version of our Lean Training System module video. If you want to watch the whole video, check it out at Velaction Videos. If you want to make sure you don't miss the next LTS video that we post, please be sure to subscribe down below. We also always appreciate likes as it helps us get viewed more and makes us keep adding additional content. Thanks for watching and best wishes on your continuous improvement journey.